uh, on the left hand side is a 10 year old, you know, so just create the persona of a 10 year old uh, at the top on the left hand side. And then in the middle, the 10 year old could be male or a female, uh, the gender does not matter in this context. And then in the middle, I want you to create a persona of a 30 year old, just imagine a 30 year old, you know, what, the, what you know, they could look like, etc. And then on the far right, I would like you to create uh, the persona of uh, a 70 year old. So you've got three pictures in front of you. You've got a 10 year old, and then you've got, um, you know, a 30 year old. And then on the far right, you've got a 70 year old. And underneath uh, them, I would like you to think of um, a toaster, you know, that we use uh, to toast bread. And as you think of this toaster, and as we're going to be going through my presentation today, your assignment by the time we finish this meeting is to design a toasting machine uh, for a 10 year old, to design a toasting machine for a 30 year old, and to design a toasting machine for a 70 year old. So the question is, how do you design think uh, designing a toaster for a 10 year old? How do, do you design think designing a toaster for a 30 year old? How do you design think designing a toaster, you know, for a 70 year old? I'm going to introduce a variation in this moment. And the variation is for the 30 year old, imagine them being a family, you know, uh, where there is a father and a mother and there are three children. So in the context of that 30 year old, you are solving for five people, you know, with the toaster. And then in the context of a 10 year old, you are solving for one person. And then in the context of a 70 year old, you are also solving for one person. So if you were to design, think a toaster and take it to the market, how do you design it for the 10 year old? How do you design it uh, for the, you know, 30 year old? Uh, family, how do you design it for the 70 year old? And as you sketch your diagram, you know, I don't know if, um, you know, Google Chat has this uh, capability. Uh, if it has the capability, you know, once you are done with your design, you can upload your design. If it doesn't have the capability, then at the end of the meeting, you should be in a place where the Holy Spirit is uh, ministered to you, the anointing of design thinking. So, with that in mind, uh, I'm Mike. I run uh, a teaching ministry, you know, where I teach on various subjects uh, ranging from uh, the spiritual side of things, as well as, uh, you know, people uh, development. So if you are yearning for growth and you're looking for resources, you know, around uh, growing in various dimensions, uh, you can follow me on my ministry page uh, on Facebook at Impact uh, Global Faith Ministry. Further to that, uh, I'm also an author, is uh, the program director, I said. I'm currently busy writing my 77th uh, book, you know, which I'll publish in the next, you know, few months, uh, known as The Rights uh, of Passage. So if you are in need of uh, growth material, you know, that gives you a mixture of uh, the faith, as well as you know how you navigate uh, in the natural, you know you can also follow me on my Amazon page. So now, as we launch uh, design thinking this morning, uh, there are different generations that are on the phone. So I was biased here, you know, by picking something that relates to those that are you know in my <laughs> generation. So at the time that uh, I was leaving the University of Zimbabwe, it was the time that, you know, cell phones were being uh, introduced. And the first cell phone that was being introduced uh, in that season, you know, was the 5110, you know, and it was quite an innovation in that time to see a 5110. I think I couldn't afford one <laughs> as I was leaving uh, college. So it was a marvel to watch uh, those, you know, that I had the 5110 and how it rang and just to think about, you know, who went about designing such a gadget and 
what is this thing going to do? So when we look at design thinking, I would like to postulate that every single one of you, uh, including me, we are design thinkers. You know, that ability to be design thinkers, you know, comes in us uh, by, you know, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's where we get our design. That's where we get our thinking. So everything that uh, you see around you today, you know, I work in, you know, innovation uh, and I've been doing this for the last 18 months. It's not an area that, you know, I had experience working in. So when I was given the job, I just took the job, not knowing, you know, where my path is leading. But as I've been walking the journey, it has been a discovery. And one of the fundamental points, which I also shared with uh, Blessing Mutambara and Agnes last weekend, is that each of us are innovators. You know, you might not call yourself an innovator. You might not call yourself a design thinker. But the anointing in you is that powerful that you are an innovator in your own right. So I shall illustrate just a few examples, you know, to just get us to engage. But as we do that, the one outcome I desire for this meeting is for each of us to be challenged enough that we take design thinking as a tool and as a process that we will apply in our lives. So when you look at the evolution of cell phones, you know, going back to 1983, you know, moving across uh, the years, you know, to 2011, to 2022, what you see here is that there's been a variation, you know, of designs. There's been a variation of technology. There's been a variation of uh, performance and efficiency. So the point here to note is that when you look at any transition from one model to the next or from one generation to the next, what's behind that, you know, before you even go into production, you know, is a process known as design thinking. I think the guys that are in engineering, uh, whether it's mechanical or electrical, you know, they are more familiar you know, with this sort of thing, but to most of us who are not uh, in the architectural or uh, design environments, it is not immediately obvious that what you're actually dealing with when you see an end product, the fundamental input to it is actually design thinking. So the generational progression of cell phones, you know, from one model to the other is underpinned by the design thinking process what also happens in that environment is you have another concept which uh, we, we could discuss another day, which is known as systems thinking, which then gives you the ability to connect uh, various infrastructures to become a single unit for performance. Similarly, when you look at uh, the evolution of the television, you know, going back to the 1930s and moving, you know, in decades through the 1940s all the way, to the 2010s to now, you've seen quite a progression, you know, and some of you, depending on where you are born, when you were born, you can locate yourself as to when were you, you know, able to realize this thing is called a TV and what form, you know, did it take? So this progression that we see in the evolution of uh, the television sets the process behind it is also a design thinking process because you apply your design thinking first before you go into production and then we the consumers end up buying a product but there has been you know a solid process that was sitting behind it similarly if we look at automobiles uh, just at large in this instance without considering uh, the particular make or a model what you see from 1886, you know, transitioning through the generations is how design thinking has evolved, you know, in order to bring us uh, the variations of, um, you know, automobiles that we have experienced over the years. And then similarly, if you are a BMW fan, just for the 
purposes of uh, engagement here, you know, I chose uh, a three series. You can go and, you know, look at all the other models just to look at the progression. Here we see the progression of um, the BMW from 1975 to now. This is the C three series. And you look at how the designs have changed over the years. And all this at the heart is underpinned by design thinking first and then production uh, following. Similarly, if you are a Mercedes-Benz fan, you know, here is uh, the evolution of the E-Class, you know, across generations. From time to time, you know, we have seen people apply different thinking in the design of these uh, automobiles. And today we see a very classic um, E-Class, but over the years it has actually come through, you know, a series of evolution. And at each stage where there's been a new model, what has been underpinning that, you know, is a process of um, design thinking. And then those that like Formula One, you know, you have seen uh, the various cars that have been manufactured, you know, over the years. So if you look at uh, the evolution of the Mac, you know, in 1954, what the car looked like for performance, et cetera, you, you look at its progression to the year 2010, and then also to the year 2021, I'm not going to talk about the 2022 for now because I, I am a Mercedes uh, fan. So we are not performing well there. So something hasn't gone well with our design, you know, thinking. But fundamentally, be, before production, you have to engage with um, the concept of, you know, design thinking. How do you actually, you know, make this vehicle for performance? How do you make it in a manner that it can compete with Ferrari? It can compete with Red Bull? So you have to apply quite a detailed thinking ahead of, um, you know, production. And then similarly, when you look at uh, mail, we have moved from various uh, types of uh, communication platforms, you know, starting with tape notes, you know, and then parchments and then paper mail, you know, those, you know, that were in school in the 90s and 80s, you know, you could remember that. The primary way of communicating was writing one another a letter. You know, you buy an envelope, you buy a paper, you buy a stamp, you write the letter, you seal the envelope, you go to a post box, and then it takes about three days, four days, five days, or even longer, you know, for your message to reach uh, the recipient. And then we saw the evolution of the telegram, followed by email, SMS, and then now we are in the messaging uh, world. And each evolution here, you know, that we see before it comes into production, it is underpinned by design thinking. And then when you look at, uh, you know, where design thinking can work and can go wrong, you know, you can look at, um, you know, institutions, you know, in Manu is a very good example, you know, that you have an institution that performs very well uh, under, you know, one leader and then post uh, the departure of that leader, you actually get it wrong across all fronts. And the question you ask there is, is design thinking being applied, you know, in the context of um, thinking about the strategy of running this club? So you get scenarios around what can go wrong, you know, if design thinking is not applied, what can go right if uh, design thinking is applied, you know, correctly. Again, when you look at the evolution of uh, computers in this instance, I chose Apple as a brand. You know, you look at them from 1976, you know, all the way to now, you can see how Apple, you know, has progressed over the years and the progression from one model to the next, you know, behind the scenes is underpinned by a design thinking process. Similarly, when you look at uh, the music industry, you know, going back to 1887, you know, vinyl records uh, were the in thing, and they lasted for quite a long time. You know, many people were born in the world of LPs and all of that. And then there was a progression from vinyl records to cassette tapes, you know, cassettes, cassette tapes themselves were quite an innovation at the time. And then there was the evolution of moving from cassette tapes, you know, to audio CDs, you know, and if you integrate this technology into the automobile 
automobiles as an example. You know, we had a generation of cars, you know, that were suited, you know, with uh, radio platforms to connect, you know, cassette tapes that was, uh, you know, outdone and undone by the evolution of CDs. You know, you would buy cars with CD shuttles, et cetera. And today you buy cars with no CD shuttle, no CD slot. And then we moved on to MP3 players being the in thing around music. And then that progressed to cell phones. And now we speak of Spotify, you know, as a platform, you know, for engaging in music. And behind each of these evolution uh, points is a process of uh, design thinking. And then production then follows, and then we as the consumers then get to engage with the product. So when you look at, uh, you know, this evolution of design thinking, uh, what I say to Blessing is, you know, this message, you know, is for individuals, it is for professionals, you know, we have to really elevate, you know, to understand where our world is going so that we are prepared. Primarily, you know, if, I, if we have parents, um, you know, in this meeting that are raising children uh, who are still trying to figure out which career direction do they take, what sort of education do they go for, what I would like to set as a seed in this meeting is for you to start thinking about skills as much as you know you consider the body of education across any discipline fundamentally you need to focus on skills what skills do you want your child to acquire and then to those that are you know in various forms of professional environments you also must you know engage around you know what skills are you acquiring are you future fit are you relevant to the world that we are getting into so every five years, uh, the World Economic Forum conducts a global study on, under the banner of what they call the future of jobs. And then in that, they, I, they engage various organizations, institutions to understand what skills are being required so that there's preparedness around the future fit from an employee or a person perspective. So when you look at the evolution I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but just for outlining purposes, in 2015, our top 10 skills were around, these are in order of significance. So complex problem solving, you know, was number one, followed by coordination, people management, critical thinking, you name it. And then just check out creativity there. You know, it was sitting at number 10. And then you move five years later, you know, into 2020, what skills you know are being required in the world we live today you know complex problem solving retained uh, number one and then critical thinking moved up you know to number two and then creativity number three and then the rest follows so that was then as we speak now uh the world economic forum have now done a study of the skills that are required you know for the year 2025 and beyond and sitting on number one there is your analytical thinking and innovation. And then secondly, you know, active learning and learning strategies. And then thirdly, complex problem solving and then uh, critical thinking and creativity. So when you are preparing your child for the future, you need this framework in mind so that as you are marrying, you know, your uh, his or her path, you know, you also have to engage on, are they acquiring, you know, the skills that are needed for the future so that they don't land with the qualification. And then there is a mismatch between the qualification and, you know, what is being demanded for in the marketplace. So we have to close the gap. So it is in this regard that I uh, put before you that when you look at number one to number four, what's sitting in there as a core theme is thinking this then elevates that design thinking is indeed something very integral not only historically but the future that we are going is going to be underpinned by a lot of thought behind it 
So we then have to engage on this subject of design thinking. Similarly, when you look at skills, you need to look at them across various um, uh, settings. So we have to look at these skills around what abilities you know, should we build, what basic skills should we build, and what are the cross-functional skills that are needed for us you know, to be relevant in this fourth industrial revolution era. So again, you know, as you connect the dots, you will get to a conclusion that you know, design thinking you know, is a core requirement to the world we are in right now. And if we fast forward you know, five years and 10 years from now, it becomes even more important. So this is very interesting because you know, as men, as women, for the most part, we have all come across you know, uh, Proverbs, you know, 23-7, as a man thinketh, so is he, you know, if you put it in the context of our setting today, as a man or a woman, design thinketh, so is he or she. So this is not something that is just, you know, in the world, but the world is actually adopting a biblical principle and using it as a basis of um, evolution and innovation. So the notion around uh, design thinking, uh, we have to look at this, you know, whatever the Lord will minister to you uh, today, you have to look at it first at an individual level in everything that, you know, you do from your personal planning, uh, you know, your career, whatever you are planning to invent, whatever you are planning to innovate, how are you applying design thinking? Are you design thinking about your life or is just moving randomly without any design behind it? Similarly, as we gather, you know, in this group uh, is the Christian men's ministry this morning. How are we applying design thinking, you know, in thinking about the process around our ministry, how we move forward, the programs we run, the various functions, et cetera, et cetera. When you come to a family setting, this is a concept that you can also apply in your family. As you think about the vision for your family, what is the design thinking in your family vision? As you think about the programs pertaining to your family, what is the design thinking in those programs? As you think about the legacy that your family you know will live upon this earth what is the design thinking behind it when you are at that dinner table you know discussing issues discussing plans are you applying any design thinking so today you will be equipped and empowered with some tools that you can apply in the family you can apply in the ministry and you can also apply at a personal level to those that are running organizations or those that are employees, you've got teams uh, to run. Are you applying any form of design thinking in your organization? So it's something that is applicable across the board. So a critical part of um, our life is thinking, you know, and the question that we have to engage on is, are we allowing for any time to think, you know, in our lives? So if you just take a step back at an individual level, you know, I'm blessing Tambara, you know, am I thinking? If your answer there is yes, the question is, how much time, you know, are you allocating each day to think? Because often, you find a number of people pushing and moving along on autopilot. They have no thinking time at all. You know, you go to their journal and you ask, where in your journal are you documenting your thinking? And there's nothing in the journal, you know, written pertaining to one's thinking. So as we saw, as a man thinketh, you know, or a woman thinketh, so is he or she. We have to set aside time to think literally in our scheduling we have to create time to think, whether it's 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, one hour in the morning, one hour at night. We have to set that time to think. And in that time to think, 
this is where we can design because you literally have to create a space for it. You know, it can happen in bits and pieces, but if you really want to develop a construct that has got value in it, then you have to dedicate the time to, to it. So there are various techniques, you know, that people used to think, you know, uh, in business school, they primarily advocate the, you know, De Bono, six thinking heads. And these heads are the green head, the blue head, the yellow head, the white head, the black head, and the red head. These are not heads where you say, I only operate as a yellow head. I only operate as a red head. I only operate as a blue head. No, we have to go into each of these spaces when we are applying our thinking because in the world of our design thinking, you literally have to take a holistic view, a 360 view. So how do you get to think in different ways so that you can be able to uh, produce something of value? So these De Bono thinking heads, the white heads is around what data, facts, you know, and information do I know or I need for my design? The red head is around, you know, your feelings, your hunch, your instinct, and your intuition. Your black head is more around, you know, difficulties and potential problems, you know, because you have to look at various scenarios, you know, in your thinking. And then your yellow head, you know, is around values and, you know, and benefits. And then your blue head is around how do you manage process? And then your green head is around, you know, creativity solutions. So in a natural setting, you know, where you are applying these techniques, when you are doing your, your design thinking for whatever setting, you have to enter into a white head space and then you design think in that space. You have to enter into a red head space and you design think in that space. You have to enter into your black head space and design think in that space. And then you also, you know, draw interlinkages between the heads. So how does white and red think together? If you add black, if you add yellow, and then you do the various mixes, when you are done with the whole lot, you would have uh, come across and come up with a lot of scenarios, which you then have to, you know, make choices upon as you choose on, you know, a solution uh, to pursue. So there are various frameworks out there uh, that relate to design thinking and for the purposes of uh, our engagement today, I chose to uh, leverage the Stanford Business School uh, Design Thinking Framework. So how this works is it runs through six stages, you know, starting with empathizing, you know, followed by defining, then ideating, then prototyping, then testing, then implementing. So all of these six, you know, they apply, you know, in every scenario. So when you are design thinking for your own life at an individual level, you have to look into every one of these. So where is the empathy in this context? Where is the definition in this context? How am I ideating, you know, what sort of ideas am I generating? And then as you go into solution mode, you know, what sort of solutions are, you know, are you formulating? So your first phase, which speaks about empathy and definition is really around understanding. So you have to create understanding. And then once you create understanding, you go into exploring, you know, what is the universe of possibilities? And then from exploring, you are now going into production. How do you turn this into a product, a solution, or a service of value? So if we put some words behind it, you know, empathy is around, you know, getting an insight, you know, so how do you get an insight in a formalized setup? You know, this could constitute a formal research, you know, in this world, we're quite blessed because all information is available on the internet for the most part, you know, so how do you create an insight towards uh, your targeted audience? You know, this could be in a ministry setting, it could be in a profit organizational setting, it could be in other non profit organizational setting, you know, whatever your target is, where is the empathy, a connection to that? And then your definition is very critical because once you have an insight, you are now trying to define, you know, what exactly am I, am I trying to solve, you know, as a problem? And then once you move from definition, you are now in a zone where 
you know, you're generating ideas, you know, and this idea generation, particularly to those, uh, you know, guys uh, and ladies on the call, we have got uh, children, you know, if I would encourage a takeaway from this meeting, please, 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 please encourage uh, the young ones to generate ideas. You know, don't, you know, push them back, you know, if they are telling you of the stuff they are thinking, but rather try and create an environment for the young ones to continually ideate. And then once you have ideas, you know, you start thinking about how do I turn these ideas into solutions? You know, this is where your prototyping comes in. And in a moment, I'll walk you through uh, what some of that, you know, is and is not. And then once you have possible solutions, you know, we move into the testing. How do you actually test that what I'm thinking will work or will not work? And then once you have a solid view, you know, you then are transitioning into, you know, your implementation stage. So design thinking works uh, within a framework, you know, and there are various frameworks out there, but, you know, this, you know, is something that, you know, I believe uh, brings a lot of it together. So from a level one perspective, it starts up, it, 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 it starts with principles. So you've got a principle around focus, you know, whom are you targeting in your design? You know, we looked at the design of cars, design of cell phones, and all of us on the call, we have got various audiences that we are targeting. So the question is, who are you targeting? That's your user focus. And then how do you, you know, frame your problem? You know, every solution that you build, you know, has to be set around these are the problem statements that I'm trying to solve. And then more importantly is the principle around collaboration. You know, everything we do, you know, always must work in the context of a team. You know, a family is a team, you know, a wife is part of the team, a husband is part of the team, every child is a team member. You know, how do we collaborate? You know, when we come together in a Christian men's uh, ministry, you know, how we bring our gifts and talents together, you know, it's a collaboration. And then experimentation is a key part of, um, of design thinking. And I'm just gonna elaborate on this a little bit more. So historically, many people have wanted to develop the perfect thing. You know, it has to be perfect, 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 right? But the world we are now moving into is changing somewhat when you look at what uh, the World Economic Forum, you know, is saying, they are currently saying that one of our challenges is a notion called velocity. And by velocity, what they mean is everything is changing so fast around us that if you take, you know, five years building something, uh, by the time you be, you've, you're finished building and you wanna take it to the market, the market has changed so much that your solution is no longer relevant. So in a world that is faced with velocity, how you engage the market is through experimentation because the market is not gonna wait you know, upon you or for you. The market continues to move, the technology continues you know, to evolve, the operating systems continue to evolve, the infrastructure continues to evolve. So your ability to catch up with the trend is through experimentation and then you make adjustments as you go. And then last but not least is really around the visualization. You know, can you see and what can you see? So as you build on your principles for design thinking, you then have to adopt, you know, various mindsets. And each of the principles requires, you know, a, a mindset. So for example, when you look at your user focus in your building of a solution, are you empathetic or not? And that empathy, you know, is contrasted to sympathy and it's also contrast, contrasted to compassion. So how are you being, you know, empathic, emp empathetic, you know, in your solution design? You know, what curio level of curiosity are you bringing in your solution? And then secondly, when it comes to problem solving, the mindset you need on design thinking is without constraints. You know, so Papa Tro says, you know, no idea is too small. You know, so how do you think without constraints? How do you think holistically? And then when you go to collaboration, this is a very challenging one, especially for those, 
uh, with big egos. You know, how do you collaborate? You know, how do you allow for differences? And more importantly, you know, how do you demonstrate, you know, that uh, democratic spirit? And then experimentation is, you know, the exploration and then uh, envisioning is through visualization. As you go down now, you know, this has to link into, you know, the work attitudes. So around user focus, what sort of work attitude do you adopt? And this is across person, family, uh, organization. What sort of work attitude do you adopt for user focus? What work attitude do you adopt for problem solving, et cetera? And each of these disciplines, you know, have to be embedded for you to, you know, enable that platform for creativity. Now, when it comes to level three, it's getting a little bit more technical, but I won't uh, uh, dig into the technical. The idea here is really around what methodologies, you know, do you apply, you know, for the solution that you have in mind. So the beauty of today is if you simply go on Google and say methodologies for, you know, applying design thinking, you will get the methodologies. And then in your setting now, it's all about choosing what is relevant, you know, and these principles apply across business, you know, ministry, as well as personal and family. Now, this process is, uh, is quite elaborate and intricate, you know, but also very exciting. As you set yourself into, uh, you know, trying to, you know, apply this design thinking, on the left-hand side, you are saying, you know, how can I understand the problem that I'm trying to solve? You know, so when we look at, you know, let's say, you know, the i13 Pro or i13 Pro Max, you know, the Apple guys started off with a problem statement. You know, the guys at S22 in Samsung, they started with a problem statement. And in each of the solutions you and I are trying to solve, we must be clear on our problem statement. And then more importantly now, is we set ourselves to create solutions, we have got various tools to apply and you'll see a few of them you know, in a moment. So now, the physical space is very important you know, because you and I need a space you know, to be able to apply design thinking. So for example, when you look at uh, your physical space, how open is it or how closed is it? The notion here is that when you create openness, you know, let's say in the context of a family or in the context of, you know, Christian men's ministry in the context of uh, a corporate, how are you creating an open teamwork environment? Because design thinking, you know, operates in that process. And then similarly, how do you stimulate, you know, how do you build stimulation? How do you build excitement? That is also very, very important. And then the third one around uh, versatility is really around the fact that normally when um, Sam is working, you know, he has got this vertical view. When Mutambara is working, you know, he has got this uh, vertical view, right? The idea now around um, vertical is that it's okay to have, you know, a vertical view, but in the context of design thinking, you need to bring them together. So how you bring them together is through uh, what we call the horizontal, you know, integration, i.e. what Sam is thinking and what Mutambara is thinking, how do you bring, you know, that together and how do you create the space for the vertical and also the face, the space for the vertical in uh, the horizontal to come together. And the same would apply in a family, you know, setting as well. And then the last but not least is really around, you know, flexibility. You know, when you are operating in the design thinking space, you know, everything changes all the time. So you ought to think about flexibility all the time. You ought to allow for randomness and variation, you know, in your designs. And then the world around empathy, you know, this is probably the most important one because everything follows, you know, our connection with our end user because design thinking always has the end user in mind. So when you look at the, the end user, when we talk about empathy, you know, we're simply asking, you know, do you see their world? You know, so blessing comes and says, I want to go and consult, you know, to this, uh, you know, construction company. You know, do you see their world, you know, before, you know, you go to them? You know, are you appreciating them as human beings? Do you understand their feelings? 
and then you know how do you communicate you know to them and with them so the notion of empathy is all around saying we are in this you know together so when you are developing that innovation you know your design thinking is connecting you know with uh, the desires of the customer so when you work through this whole empathy world uh, all these tools you know they are publicly available are uh, on the internet you know you have to create you know your empathy map you know this is really you know now uh, putting attributes and words behind the various feelings right so how do you connect with how your user thinks or feels so in the context of um, you know our ministry in this context a christian men's ministry right when sam uh, is in the world you know around design thinking with his team right he has to think about how you know the members of this ministry you know think and feel you know how they see how they hear you know what they say and do you know what pains you know are they experiencing what gains are they requiring and then you create your empathy map for christian men's you know ministry or if it's a family setting the same principles would apply and then what you need to be clear about is you know the difference between empathy and pity when you're in an empathy world you are not saying i'm sorry for you you know as you do in the pity world you know in the sympathy world you say i feel for you right you are still disconnected with your end user right in a compassion world you are saying i'm moved by you the world we want to focus on is empathy where we connect with our users our members our customers you know how do we you know feel with with them so in other words we are putting ourselves in a place where we are also a consumer of the service the product that we are delivering and then as you think about this empathy map you know you need to then think about how everything interacts together so you you run a process you know which we call your ux mapping this is really ux is simply for user experience so the user experience here is you know christian men's ministry you know we meet 6 50 a.m to 8 30 a.m in the morning you know what user experience you know do we want our men you know to experience so same and team then create their empathy map, they create their customer journey map, they create their experience map, and then at the end of the day, they come up with their, you know, service blueprint. And then this gives you, you know, your UX uh, experience uh, at large. And then what's also very important, you know, is the idea of, uh, you know, the anatomy of a scenario. You know, Blessing Mutambara, you remember when I had a meeting with you this week, you know you were talking of um, you know how do you do scenarios and how do you do scenario planning in this whole design uh thinking environment you know scenarios is part of the thinking process so how do you you know create the anatomy of a scenario so you look at a person who is going on a business trip debbie in this instance she needs to book a, a book a room that is affordable and is good you know good reviews so how does she then plans out you know that whole journey so you look at here as an actor you look at here as a motivator you look at your intentions you look at the actions she has to partake of and then you look at the resolutions that she has to make as she plans her journey and in all our constru uh, constructs whether individual family or organizational we have to think about these scenarios literally i mean like use uh, post-it notes, you know, in this world, all of these things, there is technology available, you know, where you can, you know, do your mind mapping, you know, across the various anatomies. So the idea here is that you have to think everything to the detail, and then in that, you know, you start creating, you know, a design. So in the definition stage, you know, it's all about how do you develop insights, you know, how do you define a point of view, and how do you create, create a problem statement? So we are after that problem statement because a problem statement relates to either a gain point that our user is after, you know, so Sam says, I want a vision, Christian men's ministry for the next five years. He says, what are the pain points of men, you know, together with the team? You know, what are the gain points that men require? And then once that process is run, you then come up with a view that says, okay, these are all the problem statements 
that Christian men's ministry has to solve. And then this then now gives you a platform, you know, to start, you know, going into ideation. So once you have these problem statements, you are now in the ideation world, you know, so now there are various techniques you can use here, such as how do I amplify the good, you know, and eliminate the bad, you know, explore opposites, you know, and, you know, your question. And that whole question is very important because a lot of us are used to a concept called brainstorming, right? How do you brainstorm when you combine at the creation of problem statements, right, and ideation, you also move into uh, another order, which is known as question storming, right? How do you question? You know, it's a technique to question. For the problem you're trying to solve, what sort of questioning do you do? You know, that's also, you know, uh, a space, you know, you need to apply your skills to. So as you are thinking about your toaster, you know, your toaster for, you know, the 10 year old, your toaster for uh, the family, and your toaster for, you know, the elderly. You have to be in this space where you are saying, where does my empathy connect with the 10 year old in the toaster? Where does my definition connect with the elderly? You know, in my toaster design, and how do I now start ideating around my solution? And then a fascinating part of this is uh, the prototyping. And on this, I would ask you as we continue with the meeting that for the toaster uh, model that you have for the 10 year old, I want you to create maybe three variations of it. So you might have just drawn one variation. Just think about three or more variations. How would you vary you know, your original model? The toaster you are making for the family of five, how do you, how can you vary that toaster you know, in three other different forms and make each of them unique? And then similarly, the toaster that you are making for the elderly, how can you create variations of them? So there are various techniques you can use. The idea around prototyping is really to say, how do I create various forms and various types of solutions you know, to, my, to my problem? So you can prototype by a technique called sketching. This is where you are actually simply drawing you know, your solution on a piece of paper or you can apply you know, a solution which we call paper prototyping. Under sketching, you're simply drawing a sketch. But when you migrate from your sketch to a design, you are now handling you know, quite a bit of, uh, you are now applying quite a bit of design. So you literally like walk, walking through the user you know, experience you know, throughout your design. So how do you paper prototype your toaster? You can also, there are tools now available that also allow us to prototype you know, using digital technology. So you can create your prototype through technology as well. And then when you get to the stage where you actually want to test, test your prototype to the market, you can actually you know, apply that in a framework we call native uh, prototyping. This is where, for example, you, know, you can develop an app and then you test your app in the market, you know, get feedback and then refine it you know, as you go. And then wireframes are also very critical. You know, this is where you create your 3D models to your solution, right? You have a solution you are solving for the family. You have a solution you're solving for yourself or for the ministry. How do you create a wireframe? You are simply creating a three-dimensional view. The morale behind it is, have you considered all the different you know, possibilities behind it? And then this is a fun stage, you know, testing. So often we come up with a view, we come up with a hypothesis and we say, this is gonna work for Sam. You go to Sam, he says, no, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. You go to Blessing, he says, no, it doesn't work for me. Somebody else might say it works for them. So when you go to your testing, what you are wanting to connect with is, what does my target say about my design? What does my target think about my design? You know, how do they feel? about my design and does my design perform you know for them and all of these you know we have to answer as inputs now once you are done with all of this your last phase is really around implementation and in the implementation uh period you know there are various uh, techniques that you can use so what used what used to happen in the past 
and the guys that are in engineering uh, you know would know this uh, better than than I do but typically what used to happen in the past is when you are developing a solution you move it through what is called a gated approach or a gated process how that works is I design it so perfect to pass gate one and then once it passes gate one I take it to level two and then I design it so well to pass that once it passes I move it to gate three I'm now in level three etc etc until you get to your final solution the world has changed you know since uh the gated model was the ideal model the model we are now operating in today is what is now known as the spiral model the idea here is when you are thinking of a solution try and think about it in a manner that says what meets uh my users need without me creating this big solution and then when you create that minimum view you then start running iterations so you start in the circle here in the middle with the minimum view and then now uh, year upon year it could be let's say when sam started um, the christian men's ministry he had a view around it you know guys let's do measuring in men that's iteration one guys let's meet you know at my house in Dunfane. that's iteration two guys now we're doing digital meetings that's iteration three and you continue you know in that way as you do your spiral over time you know you will see uh, the incremental evolution and then a critical thing in the design thinking world is what we call agility so there's no time you know when you are in a design thinking world because as we i said earlier on the world economic forum is saying to us that we are dealing with velocity so when you are dealing with velocity you have to be quick you can't have meeting upon meeting upon meeting upon meeting and never reach a decision because by the time you reach a decision if you take too long the market may have moved and you are now way behind the market and you have to go back again to the drawing board so agile says how do i move with speed how do i catch up with the velocity so that my solution is relevant so when we are in the agile world we connect the agile world with what we call the sprint methodology and within sprints all it is is to say whatever solution that i need to develop how do i do it so quickly so let's say sam uh thinks of uh, a new process you know he wants to you know introduce you know in christian men's ministry instead of sam saying guys let's go to the drawing board for the next six months sam says for idea one, we're going to test it in the month of, um, you know, June. That's your sprint cycle one. You run your two meetings in the month and you learn from it. And then when you go to July, you are now running your sprint two. When you go to August, you are now running to sprint three. The difference between Agile and the connection of sprints to your traditional planning methodology is where Sam would have run a three months uh, period to redesign Christian men's ministry in this instance you are planning and redesigning at the same time and getting feedback from you know the men around the new processes you are introducing by the time you get to you know august you've already done three sprints and organization has evolved and it keeps in touch with you know where uh, the guys are at so your sprints become very important as a methodology you know to to execute similarly you know what we advocate you know in design thinking that ties to your sprints is how do you apply scrum methodology so scrum methodology is all about whatever solution you are trying to design you need to create a process for it so who owns you know this problem statement so you come up with your 10 problem statements in the family vision you know family uh, direction family strategy now within the family you need an owner you know for each problem statement so who owns this problem statement or oh, is the wife who owns this problem statement or is the husband who owns this problem statement is child one child two child three you name it and then secondly everything works in the context of a team nothing works by a solo man or a solo woman so who is the team to execute on this and then for that particular team you choose a scrum master right so we're gonna run the saturday meetings right at cmm who is the scrum master for the meetings Mtambara is the scrum master. 
So what does the Scrum Master do? You simply bring your team together and you meet as frequently as you can and the meeting can be as long as five minutes. And when we run Scrum meetings, we're simply asking three questions. Question one, what did you do yesterday? Question two, what are you doing today? And then question three, what impediments are you facing? And then in the answering of those questions, we've got a plan for the day and a plan for tomorrow. And we continue to scrum, you know, on a daily basis. So with that, man, that is the end of my presentation today. I hand over to the program director. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Gondo. Uh, this was a very insightful presentation. Um, I think for me, what, what stood out, uh, you, you had my attention from the first slides, first few slides, uh, when you went through the evolution of skills. Um, and I think that's something that um, we, we already see, see taking place in the workplace where there's a shift from um, coordinating with others and um, maybe less uh, emphasis on, on uh, physical uh, meetings with people, obviously, as technology improves. And we're moving towards a uh, creative and, and complex uh, critical solving where uh, to me that sounds like uh, someone who's able to combine um, pieces of knowledge from unrelated fields so so call it engineering and finance you combine those uh, pieces of, of knowledge together and you uh, create a solution that's that's, that's relevant um, and i think the other thing you touched on um, was the question to self i think you just mentioned it briefly but it's it's it's, 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 it's something that um I feel uh, the Holy Spirit ministered to me is when you said, uh, "Are we designing for our lives? Are we are we design thinking for our lives?" Is is it, it really just touched me because um, you then followed up and said, "Is the information we are applying um, relevant to where we are in 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 our lives?" So yes, we might be taking in a lot of information. We might be um, applying a lot of the information, but is to always have that critical thinking to say uh is this information though useful is it is it is it is it critical to to the stage and and, and point i'm in I'm, I'm i'm in my life but um at this point we just want to go to the uh questions and, and comments so uh i please uh, i just encourage you to just uh, post any any questions you have uh to mr gondo in, to, in in the comment section and we will touch on them and, and and go through them so i think the first one we have is from uh brother blessing uh, who's asking, uh, Mr. Gondo, is there a difference between thinking and meditation? <laughs> right. Blessing. I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll attempt, um, you know, to, you know, to answer that. So meditation, um, you know, primarily, primarily relates to, you know, creating uh, a space of um, quietness, you know, where your primary focus is around listening and hearing. You know, that's primarily and predominantly the space for meditation. So you apply a quiet space, you primarily focus on listening, you know, and hearing. And in that whole construct of listening and hearing, you also encounter some form of visualization. And then when you look at uh, thinking, it's a meditation, or, sorry, it's an elevation above meditation because in the thinking environment, you are actively engaging your mind and you are saying to your mind, I want you to think, start thinking, think about this, think about that, think about this, think about that. And then in the meditation environment, a lot of the questions you probe in thinking, you know, constitute noise to meditation. So in the meditation, it's more a quiet space, more a reflective space, where the key critical techniques you are applying is more listening and hearing. Whereas in the thinking, you are actively probing the mind and you are saying, think about A, think about B, and you go back and forth and you create a lot of noise within the thinking environment. So that will be the line between the two for me. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I then move on to a comment from uh, uh brother jones who is saying it's very interesting how design thinking fitted in one of the courses i did and how we're applying design thinking uh, and how we were and how we were uh, applying design thinking uh, design thinking ap applies across the board uh, in every facet of our lives and uh so uh just 
Uh, one question I have, I think just to, uh, to tie into that comment is to say, um, and we know that you're an author who's written 60 books, uh, over 60 books, is to say, uh, of the books you've written, is there a specific book you can uh, point us to which uh, speaks to a lot of the material you were um, uh, ministering today so that we are able to, I think in our personal uh, time, just uh, go through it in, in a much more thorough, maybe, um, um, uh, way. All right. Thank you. So I haven't written a book on um, design thinking as yet, but, you know, some of the books I have written that could, um, you know, contribute to this is I've written a book on the mind. I've written a book on imagination. I've written a book on thoughts, you know, so those three books I would, um, you know, assist, but they were not written from the perspective that the outcome is, you know, to, you know, to have a design thinker. When I went into authoring, um, I wasn't even a design thinker. I had not even come across, you know, the term design thinker. You know, but, you know, the books that I've written that relate to thinking, you know, it's your mind as a book, and then hearing as a book, and then imagination as a book, and then thoughts as a book. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from our chairman who's asking, uh, that was great, uh, Mr. Gondo. Are you able to share how this design thinking has helped you with bringing up your boys and how they choose their careers? <laughs> right, thank you, that's very interesting. So before I came across, uh, you know, the concept of uh, designing, design thinking, you know, I wasn't uh, actively and proactively you know, applying what I would call end-to-end -end, uh, thought processes, you know, to the things that I do. So what started happening in my own journey was, as I came across design thinking in combination with uh, innovation, I started looking at every single thing, right, in the context of what was the thought behind it, why is a cup made in this way, you know, why is a bottle made in this way, why is a stove made in this way, et cetera, et cetera. And the more I did that, the more I started connecting with the spirit of design thinking and how it works. So when it comes to me and um, you know the raising of uh, my boys, first and foremost is we talk about this subject literally almost on a daily basis because I have been engaging uh, my children on the concept of uh, innovation together with design thinking because it's a revelation for me. It's something I didn't know at all, only gotten to know when I was assigned to do a job that, that has to do with this. And as I got into the job now, it's only when my eyes, in a way, opened. So how I apply it in my own family is without fail, you know, we tend to have like a family meeting on a daily, you know, basis at, you know, our dinner table and we discuss, you know, all sorts of uh, subjects. And one of the subjects we discuss without a uh, fail, you know, is, uh, you know, is innovation. So in a lot of the things that we do, we bring it in as a concept. This is from an integrated family level. And then when it comes to me now as a person, as this skill, you know, it, it is still at its, at its early stage, Sam, but as the skill is developing and evolving, you know, in my own life, I'm now very intentional and deliberate around interrogating, you know, a lot of these statements. So if I give you uh, an example, what I do with my uh, three children is that every single year you know we enter into what we call our family vision you know process and we started this you know way back when my wife was still alive so what we do is we we spend about two weeks in december working through every individual's vision and every individual's you know goal you know for the coming year and then we then you know do a workshop you know where we do our own goals as a family combined and then once we are done we then document them. We create a web document, which we PDF, and then every person has got a copy. And then this year we created a new design where after we completed our vision document for the family, we then broke it down into 20 blocks. And then for each person in my own bedroom, I then went and put these 20 blocks on the wall. And then for each of my children, whatever is relevant for them and to them, they've got those blocks on their walls. So when my children enter their bedroom, they see their blocks on the wall. So they are reminded of, this is what I'm designing for the year 2022. And I got my own reminders. 
So that's how you know I'm learning to apply the process at this stage. Okay. Okay. I think if you can just repeat the 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 step of of the twenty blocks. So I think I've got the um, aspect of uh, <laughs> have, you know having the goals and, and goal setting you know as a family uh, collectively yes. and individually. But I think if you can just repeat the stage right. of the breaking into the twenty. Blocks. Okay. Yeah. All right. What what we did was this is our, our first year to to do it because our vision process. Over the last, I think, 15 or 16 years, because we started our visioning in 2006. So what we're doing over the last 16 years was each year when we do the family uh, visioning, uh, you know, week uh, and weeks, you know, we document the vision into a web document. So what you will see in, in our uh, family vision is you have a section that relates to Mike, a section that relates to each of the family members and then our aggregate goals. But this year now we're inspired differently. Once we finished the document, we then started identifying what themes apply, you know, to Noah. For the themes that apply to Noah, we then wrote those themes on an A4 page. And then we then went to PostNet and eliminated, you know, the A4s. And then we, we put them on, on, Paul, uh, on Noah's wall. And then the same for Ethan, the same for Onai. Okay. And then in my bedroom now, I then took the total 20 blocks that constitute our family vision. And okay. each of them is on an A4, and all of them are eliminated. Okay. Yes, okay. that's okay. how it okay. is, yeah. OK, all right, OK. No, that, that's, that's understood. Uh, uh, thank you. And I think it's very powerful that you have that visual aid um, on a daily basis. Uh, each person, you know, as, as they wake up, whether it's for school or for um, on the weekend or whatever it is, they have that visual aid of uh, what it is that they set out in the year um to do i think we'll go to the next uh, uh i think it's, a, it's it's both a comment and and uh, a, a question um from brother john's again uh he says i like how mr gondo simplified the processes we go through at the workplaces of agile uh through scrum methodology sprint planning uh ux and the aspect of empathy um i think maybe for the context of of all the people uh, on the call maybe um uh, Mr. Gondo, if you could just maybe just share with us uh, maybe some of the processes you would have uh, implemented uh, at Agile, uh, maybe <laughs> what it is that the, 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 they were trying to uh, address um, and and um, what was implemented. All right. So on the call, uh, I've got some of my team members from Namibia. So Daniel has joined uh, the call from Namibia. Okay. I've got Mabeta, uh, who has joined us from Sandlam, Zambia, is on the call, and a few of our, you know, my team members across uh, the continent, they are on the call, and, okay. you know, they'll be able to witness uh, to this. So how we apply, um, you know, Agile within my teams and across the nations is that any assignment uh, that um, we embark on, we want to take it to the market as quickly as yesterday. So what typically happens with implementations, let's say, of a new product, I mean, in insurance, your normal cycle to implementing a new product runs from nine months to 18 months. That's your typical timeline, nine months to 18. You know, you'd be very lucky to get it within 12 months. It's more around the 15 month mark. So what we have done, you know, in Namibia, as an example with Daniel on the call, we implemented, um, a solution you know to sell insurance through point of sale devices that you find with the vendors spasa shop or a tax shop owners it took us five weeks from start to finish in a way it could have taken us let's say um six months or nine months and our ability you know to do it within uh, five to six weeks was through having a weekly uh, intervention weekly progress check weekly alignment and get everybody on track. Okay. There is a process we are implementing in the US at the moment, uh, in, in, in the UK at the moment with uh, you know, a partner. And we decided to, to do our implementation within 21 days. So every day from 7.45 to eight o'clock in the morning, we are meeting to run a Scrum meeting where we ask those three questions and we are on track you know, to go live within 21 days. The quickest I have seen, Jones, has been when we implemented a Facebook sales platform in Botswana. This is how this is when you sell, um, you know, products through Facebook. We said and we said this is on the seventh of February this year. 
that we want to go live with our Facebook solution on the 25th of February. We all laughed because <laughs> we thought it was impossible. But actually, from the 7th of February, we were able to go to the market and launch our Facebook solution on the 25th of, um, of, um, of February. What he hoped us to get there was to actually run daily meetings. So every day we did a daily check-in. Did you do what we were supposed to do yesterday? If not, you know, are you going to catch up today? And then if you did, what are you doing today, et cetera. And then throughout the day, you know, you run ongoing communication and engagement. And then as a leader, my primary assignment is to enable and to also motivate and inspire, you know, my teams. So I lead from the front, you know, and then the team gets motivated to see, oh, you know, Mike is on the caller at 7.45 every single morning, you know, without fail. Most of the time, I would have dropped my children from school and I'm still driving to the workplace but I still participate, you know, in the daily meetings and then my teams are also committed. So it's more through breaking the task down into daily tasks and then instead of managing yourself on a monthly cycle, you manage yourself on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bundo. And I think on that note, um, I think we have come to the end of our, our questions and comments. Um, so I think I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the ministry for um, obviously taking the time to come and share with us um, this very insightful wisdom. Um, again, I know I had asked about a specific book that you may have wrote um, uh, around design thinking, so it, it might be that the Holy Spirit is ministering to you uh, to put some sort of uh, material together for, for, for people to be able to, 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 to access. Um, but once more, we'd, we'd just like to thank you for, for obviously taking the time this morning to, to share. Um, I think this is very um, critical and very applicable uh, and very practical wisdom that 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 we've we've been granted, and um, uh, we believe that obviously, as you as you shared, uh, the men have been very engaged, and will be looking at ways that they can um, implement uh, uh, um, what you shared. And if they are ready, you know, ways to maybe just sharpen it or, or extend it to uh, various extended family members or or the people around them. So, uh, thank you once more. And I think at this point, I'll just close our session in prayer. Okay. Thank you, Father God, for this morning, Father God, the session we've had, Father God, with the speaker you've brought to us, Father God, Mr. Gondo, Father God, we thank you, Father God, for the wisdom you've bestowed unto him, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for the faithfulness, Father God, to the ministry, Father God, you've imparted upon him, Father God. We pray, Father God, that even as he has shared with us, Father God, we pray, Father God, that you continue to expand, Father God, him in, in wisdom, in stature, in knowledge, Father God, in these areas, Father God, even as he's allowing himself Father God to be used as a resource as a tool Father God for 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 your kingdom Father God we pray Father God over his life Father God we pray for over his children Father God we pray Father God that you continue to guide them Father God in excellence and wisdom Father God to you continue to uphold them Father God to bless them Father God we pray for all the men Father God connected to this platform Father God we pray Father God for for you to continuously follow God, walk with them for God, even as they've come unto this platform, follow God, humbly follow God, opening them, opening themselves up to your